Welcome everyone. We are live and broadcasting, um, but we're going to wait a few moments while people file in from the waiting from the from the waiting room uh, into the webinar. And it takes a little bit of time for everyone to get into into the webinar space. And uh, and so while we while we wait, um, I'm going to kick off a few introductory statements. My name is Sarah Higgins. I'm the editor and artistic director at Art Papers. Um, welcome everyone to Founding Stories, Oral Histories of Grassroots Atlanta, which is presented by Art Papers in partnership with Meredith Cooey, who is here and will be joining us later uh, more full on in the Q&A session. Founding Stories is made possible in large part by a grant from Emory University's Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library and supported by Georgia Humanities in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development through uh, funding from the Georgia General Assembly. This discussion is the final panel in a five part two day symposium which has taken a decade by decade look at some of Atlanta's DIY artist run and grassroots spaces. This series is focused on beginnings, the events and broader context that led to the creation of these spaces, the opportunities that allowed them to occur um, and the challenges that had to be overcome in those early days. Right now we're joined by the founders, co-founders or those involved closely with the genesis of projects that began in the 1970s. There will be time for questions um, from the audience in the last 30 minutes of the panel, but you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A function, which is down at the bottom bar of your Zoom window. It says Q&A and it's some speech bubbles. Um, that's a space where the audience can communicate uh, questions either for a particular panelist or for the whole panel. And we'll, um, we'll get to those in that last 30 minutes. We'll also be using the chat function to communicate with the audience, um, providing instructions, links, information that you may um, want to know about. So if you open the chat window, you'll see um, those communications coming from us. Um, each panel in this series is moderated uh, by a member of the community who experienced these initiatives firsthand, uh, and in some cases who operated or participated in similar concurrent projects. For this panel, we're very pleased and honored to welcome moderator, Dr. Candy Tate. Uh, Dr. Tate is uh, an art historian and historic preservationist with a doctorate in history from Clark Atlanta University. Her dissertation focused on Atlanta's Neighborhood Arts Center and cultural politics. She is the assistant director at the Emory College Center for Creativity and Arts and a community advocate for Atlanta's West Side. So I can't think of anyone more appropriate to lead this conversation than you, Dr. Tate. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. And while you introduce our panelists, I'm going to show the audience through screen share a, a little slideshow of images that we've put together. Um, so take it away, Dr. Tate. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to Art Papers. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Michael Lomax, who's um, currently president and CEO for the United Negro College Fund. Since 2004, Dr. Lomax has served as president, CEO, the nation's largest private provider of scholarships and other educational support for African-American students and a leading advocate for college readiness. The UNCF, at the UNCF's helm, Dr. Lomax oversees the organization's 400 scholarship programs and awards more than 10,000 scholarships a year. He also serves on the board for KIPP Foundation, America's Promise, Teach for America, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. He founded the National Black Arts Festival here in Atlanta, was a founding member of the Smithsonian Institute for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and serves as it served as the chairman for the Fulton County Commission in Atlanta and there was the first elected to that post. He was at the helm of the Bureau of Cultural Affairs under Maynard, Mayor, Maynard Jackson during the time of the Neighborhood Arts Center. Our second panelist is Chip Simone, who's a photographer, director mentor of the South Street Photography Group. 
and he was a founding member of Nexus. Chip is a photographer from Worcester, Massachusetts, who holds a photography degree from the Rhode Island School of Design. After moving to Atlanta in 1972, he helped found Nexus, Atlanta's first photography gallery. And in 1982, he received a photography fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. His prints are included in major collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the High Museum of Art, Houston Museum of Fine Arts, Museum of Contemporary Arts in Georgia, the Worcester Historical Museum and the Sir Elton John Photography Collection. He's published two books and is still walking the streets shooting photography. So uh, we're, we had the fortunate opportunity of talking about the 70s. Gentlemen, thank you. Dr. Good Lomax, I'm gonna get us started with uh, cultural politics in Atlanta in the 70s and our first African-American mayor who was elected, Maida Jackson. What was your connection to, if you'll take yourself off mute, yeah, and then uh, share with us that's the, the, those founding stories of, of getting a Bureau of Cultural Affairs in the city? Well, it's great to be part of this, and I think it's wonderful that we're talking about the history because Atlanta so rarely looks back, more often looks forward, and usually destroys the past. So it's good to, you know, try to to delve into it. Uh, you know, just uh, obviously a lot happened in beginning in '74 when Maynard got elected, but you know there was really context even before that. And when we're going to talk about Neighborhood Arts Center, you have to go back to you know, the civil rights movement, you have to talk about uh, SNCC and the young revolutionaries there uh, who also uh, connected to the black arts movement around the country. And there was actually a predecessor to the Neighborhood Art Center, the Center for Black Art, yeah. which, you know, maybe we'll say a little bit about here. But, uh, you know, I was, I worked in Maynard's campaign in 73. I was a speechwriter and was hired along with my then wife, Pearl Clegg, uh, to join his administration on day one. Pearl became the press secretary. I became a special assistant to the mayor. I had the duties of, of international affairs and research, but, but very early in the administration, a delegation from the arts community came to see Maynard. It was full of a lot of very establishment organizations like the museum and the high museum and the uh, symphony. But there were also individual artists there. And, and one of Maynard's aunts, Matta Wild, I mean, not Matta Wilder, but uh, Millie Jordan, who taught at, at Spelman, was there. And she was sort of the organizer of the meeting. And, and the arts community came and said, we want the city to take the leadership in public support of the arts in Atlanta. Maynard accepted that challenge and he gave me the assignment. And I worked with the arts community to create something called the Mayor's Ad Hoc Committee for the Arts. And we made the determination that the city would have a Bureau of Cultural Affairs, a really administrative cultural organization be funded uh, with support from a hotel motel tax but it also was going to be focused on individual artists, and it was going to have elements that were obviously supportive of these major institutions, but were also community based. And uh, so out of the, the work of the ad hoc committee, uh, and Shirley Franklin was one of the volunteers in that nice. initiative, uh, the, the recommendations were create a Bureau of Cultural Affairs, uh, support major arts institutions but also find ways of supporting individual artists and bringing arts into the community. And, uh, you know, I think that what we're talking about today is both uh, the individual artist support uh, at Nexus, but also at the Neighborhood Arts Center, uh, but, and, and bringing arts into the community because Nexus obviously went into the community as well. And, and, and then the, the, the other integration here is that um, the arts community became quite political. And it understood that if we were gonna have a robust cultural life, 
that was different from the kind where it was, you know, very rich people on the north side uh, as the only patrons and the only beneficiaries of the arts, that it was going to happen through public support. And they got political, you know, and, you know, I'm going to be, when we talk about Nexus and, you know, and, and you're going to talk about some of those photographers, you know, uh, they were also documenting politics in Atlanta and they were engaged in that. So it's, uh, it does begin in the seven. This this is very much a '70s activity, and uh, powerfully driven by the connection between um, an impulse to have arts and culture a much richer part of the community and more expansive in its impact. But also, and I want to just say this: black political leaders who said we're going to be patrons of the arts, and and. Uh, the, the arts community, which became one of the leading uh, points of integration in the community where black and white work together around a common purpose. So I'll stop, stop there and you can move on or ask me another question. Oh, that's a, a good segue into uh, Nexus and Chip kind of share how um, it became what it was and you coming into the city in the early 70s. Uh, I came here in 70, my wife Kathy and I moved here in 72 because uh, one of my uh, college friends, John McWilliams, had been hired at Georgia State to begin a photography program. And I, I found out about that and I gave him a call just to see how he was. And he suggested uh, that we come for a visit to Atlanta. He said there's something starting to happen here. So there was a ground swell rooted in an enthusiasm for photography. And John was a very good teacher uh, and uh, was willing to take certain kinds of risks. But <clears throat> Georgia State was a little rigid. Uh, in the 70s, you know, which is, if it was about the 60s, you would have to say, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. Uh, but the 70s had a little bit of that and it was, uh, adventuresome to say the least. So uh, many of us were photographing things that were unacceptable to the legislature of Georgia, right down the street from Georgia State. Uh, and as a consequence, we weren't allowed to show particularly nudes uh, at Georgia State. So essentially we said, well, the hell with them. If they can't take a joke, we'll start our own gallery. Uh, and, and that's really the, the, the very basis uh, <laughs> It was a response to censorship issues. Now, just to uh, put it in a context, when we arrived in 72, the city of Atlanta was about 240,000 population within the city limits and Metro was three quarters of a million. And you've probably noticed that it's grown considerably since then. But uh, at that time, everything was done sort of, uh, uh, oh, ad hoc in ad hoc ways. So uh, there were 13 of us that decided uh, that we would find the space to exhibit our work. Now, just again, in context, the, the first serious New York photography gallery, the Light Gallery, uh, began in 1971. Uh, so we weren't that far behind what was going on. And uh, I don't know that there were many other galleries focusing on photography in this Part of the country to begin with. We had a very uh, sort of exacting, uh, fussy criteria for being part of the group. You had to be serious about photography and beyond amateurship and st stuff like that. And we rented a space, uh, you saw the photographs of it, uh, over on Virginia Avenue in the Virginia Highland neighborhood. And we, all, we each chipped in and uh, uh, paid the rent and paid the utilities. There was no censorship of any kind uh, to it. And uh, we started putting on monthly exhibitions. And in time, uh, more and more people became interested. There was a little, there were a few dust ups when we would find people that we didn't think were ready for our program yet. Uh, it caused some, some animosities, uh, but we were serious about good photography and uh, so what started happening after that was because uh, the museum had no photography program. They had a, they had a few 
uh, I think Lucinda had given them, Lucinda Bunnen had given a few uh, prints by uh, Clarence John Laughlin, the uh, New Orleans photographer. And uh, I think that's what Vigtel uh, brought over. But Goodman Vigtel came to us for advice about looking at photography. They were really, they hadn't gotten there yet. You know, now they've got a six or 7,000 print collection uh, and yet another curator who I understand is quite good. I've not met her. Uh, so in that, in that period of time, uh, more and more people became intrigued by photography. The, the medium, the discipline was growing and it started growing in academia. So uh, there were more people moving to Atlanta, having studied photography, having learned about certain photographers uh, and such. And, and we tried to embrace uh, all of those people to the best of, of our ability. And we kept the gallery going uh, on a monthly basis for a few years. And then the, uh, there are two people that were very instrumental. John McWilliams was who I call the godfather of the photography community here because he really was the uh, a gravitational center uh, of what drew people together for it. And uh, uh, a younger fellow named uh, Michael Reagan, who Michael is close, uh, was very close with. And uh, I believe Mike, the two Michaels uh, spent some time talking about ways in which Nexus could be expanded and grow it to another level. Uh, and Michael found uh, the Forest Avenue School, the, Ill, the uh, ill-named Forest Avenue, named for Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. And, uh, uh, but anyway, they, they hatched this plan. And uh, it was, I guess, sort of a dollar a month kind of thing, basically. And what happened was the, the photography gallery uh, remained, but it, it changed space. And uh, there was enough space. In fact, we had it uh, on, on uh, Ralph McGill Boulevard, I'll refer to it as proper name now. Uh, it was an enormous building and uh, people like Michael Reagan, who loved having sledgehammers in their hands and destroying stuff, they started knocking out walls and, and they eventually built on the third floor, the third floor of the gallery was uh, the second largest gallery in the city next to the High Museums galleries. So we were able to uh, exhibit a considerable amount of work. Plus the classrooms were, whether it was legal or not, I don't know, but they became studios for, uh, and in some cases residences for, uh, a, a variety of artists. So it was really happening. And then uh, Michael Goodman, bless his heart, he's still doing well, uh, went to Chicago and got a degree in bookmaking, master's degree in bookmaking, and he came back here and they got a, a, a serious press and they started using the press for artistic books as well as more traditional books. Uh, so there was an air of experimentation uh, that was going on and there was an enormous uh, cooperation uh, or cooperative spirit. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, the Nexus parties which became very uh, uh, popular, brought together probably more than anything from, in my recollection, uh, all the different people from the, from the arts community, uh, regardless of uh, discipline or, or race. And uh, uh, we encouraged uh, them to get involved and to spread the word about the arts. Uh, uh, and then as the, as the Michael used to be director of the BCIA. We used to tease him about the CIA part. But uh, uh, when, when that administration moved in and they started uh, doing what Michael was talking about with uh, Maynard's agenda for uh, engaging a cultural component. Uh, uh, and, and then there was the seed of money that came through, uh, which enabled a lot of artists to be hired four programs that the city was either managing or sponsoring. Uh, and uh, so a lot, of, a lot of artists were employed uh, at that point through the, those programs, which was a, a tremendous boom. It went on for a few years, I think, the, the seat of money. Uh, so, I mean, in, in a nutshell, what you started, there was a nucleus there. 
and we encourage people to try all kinds of things and to find a, a space for them to exhibit it. So they were making books. Uh, the uh, Atlanta Film Festival people moved into the facility, the dance unit, which was the name of a dance company, Leslie Morris, may she rest in peace. She was a dynamic uh, person, but we lost her at a young age. Uh, and she started a modern dance company there. Uh, so there are all kinds of things going on you know, on a regular basis. And it was real beehive of activity. Uh, and it lasted, uh, oh, I, don't know, I don't, know, don't know how many years exactly until somebody finally bought the building uh, and pushed everybody out. I'd like but to Oh, thank ahead. you, Chip. I'd like to bring Michael back in and share with us um, the Neighborhood Arts Center's version of the, you know, of the school model and um, where the where Nexus was focused on photography. Well, actually, the Neighborhood Arts Center preceded in yes. terms of the school model. What we so let me, if you go back to and I want to just make a shout out to uh, about 1970 and some of those former SNCC. Uh, community organizers who were also um, artists. I mean, A.B. Spellman, the poet, and a jazz uh, uh, critic who, you know, was down in the village with uh, Leroy Jones and Allen Ginsberg, you know, but had moved here and married a woman named Karen Spellman who had been active in SNCC. Uh, and you had this sort of you, when, I mean, you had a lot of activists, but also Atlanta had a relatively small community of highly visible Black artists. And as with uh, John McWilliams, many of them, you know, had their day jobs in the academy. So John was over at uh, Georgia State, uh, you know, earning a living as a, you know, I don't, I don't want to say, but, you know, he, would, he, he did have a Georgia State appointment and some of the photographers did. And the black artists uh, were at Clark Atlanta, you know, then Clark College. They were at Spelman College and Spelman College. They had art faculties, and uh, and and then there were people who were, you know, moonlighting and doing the work out there. But one of the things that when they came to Maynard and said, "We want to really grow the individual artist community." So you had to do two things. You had to find ways of supporting individual artists and they needed spaces. I mean, that was, that was a real clear need. So we came up with the idea of, um, of getting abandoned public school buildings and entering into year long leases, a dollar a year and using community development funds to you know, help do the, the renovations in them. And then because this was during a recession, there was something called the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, CETA. And a lot of these artists, you know, and we hired these artists. And let me just tell you, uh, I'm gonna let Chip talk about who got it over there at the, <laughs> at, the uh, at Nexus. But uh, everybody who worked for the Bureau of Cultural Affairs in the beginning, except me, because I was not making, you know, I wasn't a CETA, employee, but we had the, the, the people who were administering the program and many of the people doing the work were, uh, were paid for by CETA. And it was of such a creative use of federal funding. But just think about it. I mean, the street theater that was done by Samuel L. Jackson and his wife, Latanya, <laughs> was paid for by the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. And, and they also were over at the Neighborhood Arts Center. So we got this old Peter James Bryant school on, uh, in Mechanicsville, which is you know, not very far from where uh, the old, the, the, the more, the, now the Georgia State Stadium is. And uh, we got it for a dollar a year. We had a community board uh, and we hired a director uh, whose name is evading me, you probably know. Uh, and, and, and ultimately it became John Riddle the visual artist had that position, but you think, so we had visual artists, Joe Jennings, the jazz musician was in residence there. We had Tony Cade Bambara, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the literary uh, artist was, was working there. I mean, it was a place, so you were beginning to build this community 
And I would say the difference, I would say one difference was that their, their sort of ethic was we are building connections to the community. And I would say over at uh, Nexus, it was really building a much more self-conscious arts community of individual artists. But you know, a little difference in, in perspective, but the artists work together. And I'm so glad you shouted out Michael Reagan because you know, Michael was, you know, this, he was a very fine photographer. I thought, I mean, you have to tell me he was a fine photographer, but he was he was also documenting. I have wonderful photographs that he took of the administration, everything that we did, but he also uh, was an entrepreneur and he was creating this space. And, you know, and if you think about both spaces had had theater, Kelly Seed and Feed had some of the, did some of the space over there at, uh, at, uh, at Forest Avenue. And, and we were bringing artists in, you know, if you go back, it, it was, so there's an artist, a space for living artists in the black community, creating art, teaching, having workshops for students. But I mean, we had everybody. I mean, Romare Bearden, when he came to town, he would come to the neighborhood. I mean, it was like the cool place to be. And I would, you know, for me, uh, this is a story which is little understood, but everything that was started at the Center for Black Art and then morphed into the Neighborhood Art Center is reflected in the powerful Black artistic community of Atlanta today. There were filmmakers, there were photographers, there were writers, there were theater people. And, and you know, I just think that, you know, at a time when we are all, you know, pulling out what little hair we have left about the horrible role that politicians play, this was really a time when uh, Maynard and, and myself, and then Shirley, who was a volunteer, but when I left to run for the Fulton County Commission, she took the job as, director of, no, she took the job as director of cultural affairs when I became Parks Libraries and Cultural Affairs. And then, uh, you know, like there was this really strong belief that government supported the arts was powerful and important. And I, I want to just say one other thing about what Chip was saying, you know, this was a different Atlanta. It was, uh, you know, there was, there was censorship here. And I remember being given the ACLU Freedom of Speech Award for standing up uh, when I was over at the Bureau of Cultural Affairs to allow the, the you know, to have films by Lenny Riefenstahl in the film. Nobody was saying she was a great, for, great for her politics, but you know, you were having a, 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 an international film series and you were talking about women in film and you had to talk about this Nazi, Lenny Riefenstahl and the work that she did for the for, for Hitler and, you know, and people, they wanted to censor it and don't have her in it. And, and so we set some, some of the principles that were established early on were freedom of artistic expression and also active engagement, you know, artists who actually engaged in politics because they believed that that was part of their artistic and civic responsibility. Thank you. Um, Chip, in What's coming to mind is, you know, we, we think of, say, the arts are the mediator and the social justice um, advocates today. Um, but then it was very much a, a black and white city, um, except for the arts. So kind of, kind of tell me what it was, what was your feelings of this city? You know, again, you're coming from the north and being here. And what did it feel like for you, Chip? Well, it was one of the reasons that Kathy and I chose to come to Atlanta was because we wanted to be part of a biracial community. Uh, I mean, we moved from New York City, which is a bi multiracial community, but it was a little too, too much and a little too overwhelming. But one of the attractions uh, when we came to visit uh, was the mixed race nature of the community, uh, which I thought would be terrific. Now, uh, a lot of the people down here were still doing traditional Southern pictures. I mean, certainly for my discipline, you know, going out to the small towns and photographing antebellum buildings and all that stuff. And I had no interest in that. I'm a city kid. And I said, I'm going to walk down Peachtree Street and see what's going on and uh, go out at night and see what's going on. Uh, uh, and I, f I found it was very easy. Uh, I, I had no problems 
engaging people of color uh, in, a, in a discipline uh, that I was involved with. But I was acutely aware of the fact that there were clear uh, divisions, uh, which I always thought was uh, regrettable. Uh, and uh, I remember when uh, in Maynard's third term, uh, I was uh, chairman of, uh, I was on his subcommittee. I chaired a subcommittee in his transition team on arts and culture. We published a thick, an inch thick book. I spoke to every arts leader in the city. Uh, a woman named Edie Kelman, bless her heart, she's still around, but uh, uh, she and I, I mean, she could type and take notes and we would go and talk and get letters from people. and. We took, uh, we took the opportunity to create kind of a, uh, a packet of suggested notions or lists of wishes and dreams uh, from various organizations uh, up and down. So uh, ultimately I became more cognizant uh, of the, the bigger picture that went outside of the, the photo community. And, uh, uh, and then when, Shirley, when Andy came in and Shirley Cooks took over, uh, but under her uh, sponsorship, I created uh, two things. One was the Artists in the Schools program, uh, which put artists into fifth grade classrooms in the city, as many as we could afford. Uh, and the other was to establish the Mayor's Fellowship in the Arts, uh, which had maybe two years of a good run uh, before it became highly politicized. Uh, so, I mean, the idea was that it was gonna be on, the, on merit only. You know, that you would have a mixed community of people uh, uh, to select the recipients. There were four $2,500 prizes, enough to keep you in, you know, milk and, and honey for uh, about three months. And, uh, uh, but ultimately that didn't work because of uh, uh, kinds of conflicts that were in part rooted in racial issues. And then it became down to various disciplines and had to be well every other year we'll give to a dance group and a musical group. And then the following years we'll give to visual artists and poets and then never really, it became very cumbersome. But the, the point is that there's been a, a, a terrific, had been at that time, a real strong push to make uh, arts a very significant part of the community. And uh, in my own discipline, I think what's happened subsequent to all of all of this passage of time is that uh, things have become very academic and a lot of the uh, arts community is being driven by what I call the MFA track, uh, which is people who are going after a graduate degree and aren't quite as uh, uh, curious about their own personal vision. There seems to be a formula out there that people are following and that seems to include everybody who's out there, some kind of career path that uh, they want their first one man, sh one person show in New York when they're 22 years old and selling prints for three thousand uh, dollars. So there's there's been a, a transition which I think is consistent with the way the city has changed. When we came here, I 75 went as far as Marietta. You would get off, at, uh, take a big sweeping turn, and get off at the Big Chicken because there was no highway after that. So, you know, the city has grown, the city has expanded, the museum was still, in fact, I ran into Michael one night uh, at an opening at the High when it was still a building wrapped around the old High Mansion. And you would literally walk through a doorway and you go from a brand new building into a building that's been around probably since the early 20s, I don't know when that, when the High Mansion was built. Uh, but it was, it was just different and the museum I think was uh, encouraged to become more active. Uh, and they, they tried, and I, I think there are some curators even to this day uh, who are trying to reach out to the community. Uh, but I see, less, I see less of that idealism, idealism uh, than I, I once saw. Uh, but there was a time when there was, it was a hot town for artists, uh, they would support each other. They would attend each other's openings. They would party together. They would make food for openings. Uh, you know, I mean, it was a it was a genuine community and a and a group effort. And it was a, it was a, a terrific 
to, uh, to get involved with that. But once the, once the Forest Avenue School got bought out, then there was kind of a scramble for uh, where they were gonna find uh, a new home. And uh, Bob, uh, who was the construction guy? Uh, Bob Holder? Yes, Bob Holder. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, bought property over there where uh, uh, Nexus the, the, or the what they now call the uh, contemporary. So a lot of a lot of people were uh, disappointed that they changed the name from Nexus because we felt that Nexus had uh, earned uh, a strong reputation <clears throat> that should have been perpetuated uh, out of respect, and, and they came up with a generic name of the contemporary, which a lot of people never really. Uh, liked, but by and large, so yeah. It, I mean, it was it became increasingly complex. Uh, there were rivalries or uh, power centers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but people like myself and others just wanted to grab our cameras and go running around and uh, take pictures of whatever we wanted to take pictures, and that was still available to us. But uh, having a show every month was a little more complex because of the number of people now involved. And some of the animosities that we developed in, at Nexus because there were certain people that we wouldn't let in. And uh, they made that clear to anyone that they could talk to that we had done that. Right. You know, if I could just on that, you know, I, I, I really do. So first of all, this is a Southern city. So, you know, race is, you know, always on the agenda whether it's, you know, or it's always a subtext, it's always a part of it. Uh, you know, having, having said that, I do want to say that I think that part of the story that you would tell about the evolution of the arts in Atlanta and about Nexus and about the, the, uh, the, the Neighborhood Arts Center would be that, that the arts did become a kind of space where people got to know one another across very, I mean, very rigid geographic lines. I mean, white people lived on the north side, black people lived on the south side. Uh, the, the, the arts had always been an area where uh, there, you know, people would, you know, cross through the apartheid. So for example, in the modern dance, you know, in, there was a, a dance company here called the Carl Ratcliffe Dance Company. It was one of the early uh, dance companies and, you know, uh, they, they, their dance studio was Spelman College, <laughs> you know, <laughs> was it, at Carl, you know, and, and it was, it was a white company. Uh, there, if, if there were black dancers here, uh, and, and there were at that, the Center for Black Art, and it was, it was surely rushing, but uh, I got a note from Pearl about some of the work of Diane McIntyre. Right. That, that Diane McIntyre. So, you know, you, were, you would get in, you know, these people who maybe had a job, part-time job at Spelman or at Clark where they did have a studio program as well. Uh, and you had music and music where you could hire, but you couldn't earn a living as an artist you could not earn a living as a, as a creative artist. So you had to have a job teaching. Uh, what the, the public support of the arts did was it did begin to allow people to, um, to earn a living doing their work. It, it gave them spaces in which to do their work. And I do think that, you know, uh, you can't have a vibrant arts community singularly with the support of public dollars. But what Maynard did and then what, the, and the city did with the Bureau of Cultural Affairs and what I did over at Fulton County with the Fulton County Arts Council was we started putting money out into the arts community so people could do their work uh, with public support. And that included at every level. I mean, we were, we were among the biggest supporters of the symphony and the museum and the, you know, the, uh, the Woodruff Art Center institutions, but we were also supporting others. And we were also on, in the black community, providing the community with art spaces there. You know, so you went from the Center for Black Arts on Gordon Street 
you know, off a of cascade, and then it moves over to the Peter James Bryant School in the, the Neighborhood Art Center. Mechanicsville. Today you have a, an art center in Southwest Atlanta, and you have one of the people who was very involved in the Neighborhood Art Center was uh, O.T. Hammonds, and, and now we've, you know, we've acquired the, the Hammonds House, and the Hammonds House continues to be a visual art space, and, a, and a, you know, other elements of the arts are involved there. But I can't tell you what a desert Atlanta was. Uh, you know, there we had you know moments when when great black artists were brought to Atlanta. Hale Woodruff came here. He did the murals inside the library, where which is now the Clark Atlanta University mm -hmm. art, art Gallery. But uh, and and the there was an annual show at Atlanta University where you could. Uh, where artists from black artists from around the country would show and they would buy works. And that built the Atlanta University, now the Clark Atlanta University art collection. That was followed by some years later by Atlanta Life doing that. I don't know what happened to their art collection, but you know, there were very few opportunities for black artists to earn a living and 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 do their craft today. You know the the and, and it is because this is Atlanta. Arts and enterprise are closely connected, but it is still giving black creative artists, whether it's at you know Tyler Perry Studios or somebody else, they're getting a chance to do their work and and earn their living, and they're influencing. And we influence. I just want to you know even whether you were at the neighborhood art center. You just think about it, you know, uh, Spike Lee came through there. Uh, you know, Sam Jackson came through there. LaTanya came through there. At, at Clark Atlanta University, Kenny Leon came through there. Uh, and, and then you think about all the films that Spike made in Atlanta, and you began to be able to see, you know, a new generation of black performers. So I, I think that, uh, you know, if you tell this story about the Neighborhood Art Center and you tell this, you have to tell the story of a very intentional and strategic creation of a Black cultural Mecca community, which, which because it's Atlanta, it has a commercial element to it, but is still a place where Black screenwriters and Black, you know, Black artists can earn a living and pursue their craft. And now it's in music, it's in popular music, but it's a center for that. And I think a lot of that goes back to what happened in the 60s and 70s here in the city. Chip, do you feel that way? Do I feel that way? Yeah. I was less, I was, I was less, uh, uh, at a certain point, I was less engaged <clears throat> and concentrating on my <clears throat> my own work. When I got the fellowship from the endowment, <clears throat> I was encouraged to take some chances, try some new materials, do all that kind of stuff. And I really did withdraw uh, from a, a lot of other stuff because I was getting free film and free processing and all this kind of stuff with federal money. So I just went out like a, a crazy person and photographed. What year, uh, what year was that, the NEA? I'm sorry? What year was that? In the 70s. Okay. So it was. it was. Yeah, it was in the 70s. I was, mm -hmm. I was living here and I was lucky that it was a Kodachrome lab in Atlanta. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and I could shoot, I decided to work with color instead of black and white for the first time in my career. And uh, there was a Kodachrome lab and I would buy the Kodachrome film, shoot four rolls a day, drive out to uh, wherever the heck it was, drop the film off, pick it up the next morning at eight o'clock, look at my slides and go back out and, and photograph. So I, I spent a lot of time in the community rather than in the arts community. I walked the streets. Mm -hmm. I got to know people. Uh, I got to know a lot of the neighborhoods. I explored as much as I could. Uh, what neighborhoods were, were you in? Well, I was living in the Virginia Highland neighborhood. Okay. In fact, I, uh, we did until the beginning of this year. We, 
we were at a condo now in Midtown, right across from Piedmont Park. Uh, but we were in the Virginia Highland neighborhood. And uh, when we moved into that, it was a dead neighborhood. They were going to run a highway through it. Uh, the windows of the stores and the storefronts at the intersection were half broken. Uh, the, uh, a lot of elderly people were dying off some of the original uh, landowners and such, and they were going to sacrifice uh, parts of uh, Morningside, Virginia Highland, and Ponce Highland, and uh, Henry Park uh, for four lane highway, uh, which really changed things up a lot. And then the, the communities got together and petitioned. Uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, who was governor then, and he pulled the plug on on 485, I think was the name of the route. Uh, and Freedom Parkway, John Lewis Freedom Parkway, proud to say, uh, was going to be a six or eight lane high speed way out of town to get to, you know, somewhere else. Uh, so, th I mean, things to get to Stone Mountain, you had that one, and then you had Georgia 400. Those were the two. Uh, transportation ones that were going to go through the city yeah. and so keep going but yeah but uh, it, it affected it affected the ability i mean uh, property values started going up uh, spaces became uh, harder to find but what happened also is the, the enormity of the urban sprawl which uh, the city became a, a poster boy for uh, i mean I used to, you take it for a half hour, you drive north and you'd be in some of the prettiest farm country and all this kind of stuff. Now you can't get anywhere in a half hour, you know, because it's too jammed up at this point. But uh, what I'm finding, it, certainly in my discipline, is uh, there are an awful lot of people practicing uh, photography and the other visual arts uh, would become a more sophisticated, the museum has become more sophisticated and more demanding of, uh, of the shows that they have. There's some good curators there. Uh, and they're very cognizant of the race issue there. Uh, I'd like first to, to just really dig into um, the why these organizations and institutions were founded, you know, so to get back to the purpose mm -hmm. of the, you know, the founding stories. Uh -huh. And so kind of why did what was the missing piece? I think you've kind of shared it, but might want to reiterate with each of you uh, that made them come into being. Well, I you know I will just just reinforce that uh, uh, you know there were not places where young black artists, visual artists, uh, literary artists, musical artists. Uh, across all of the disciplines, black artists could work, could create, uh, could build an audience uh, in the city of Atlanta. There were not, I mean, you know, and, and so, you know, the, it was the role, and it was the role of government. This would not have happened were it not for the election of a black mayor who would respond to the cultural community and say, uh, we want the arts. And you know, it was a testament to Maynard's family and their background. He had an op you know, when he when he had his uh, you know, when he had his initial inauguration, uh, his aunt, you know, sings Villa Lobos with the Atlanta <laughs> Symphony Orchestra at the, you know, at the, but it was also the first time that, you know, we ever we got Alvin Ailey to come to the city to perform. I mean, you were you were you were doing two things with this sort of very intentional black cultural strategy. One is you're providing opportunities for black artists to live and work in the community, but you're also making Atlanta a kind of crossroads, a stop for what's happening uh, artistically and culturally in and in, in the black world. So you know you we, you know this was. You know, I, the first time I ever saw um, Alvin Ailey perform uh, was at the Civic Center, and we, you know, and we brought Alvin. Al, and Alvin's been coming. Uh, the, the Ailey Company's been coming ever since. The first time I ever saw the uh, Dance Theater of Harlem was actually on the stage at Davidge Auditorium at Clark College. You know, uh, the first time that. Uh, 
you know, I'm trying to think who else that I would say, you know, that, that well, the first time I ever saw Sun Ra was, you know, at the Congress of African People at the Morehouse Gym. But so, you know, there, there were, you were beginning to, this was beginning to be a kind of a, a place that people could come south and see and engage in. And, you know, so you had the, the Center for Black Art, the Neighborhood Art Center, you know, after a while that goes away, but what, what succeeds it is the National Black Arts Festival in 1988. And, you know, it became commercialized and then it, you know, it didn't have a good business plan. So it, you know, fell apart, but it was a continuation of that, of bringing a kind of cosmopolitan and global black cultural and artistic presence here. I mean, you would have Harry Belafonte and, uh, Cicely Tyson as the, you know, the presiding elders at that event and, and, and both the older performers and artists of an earlier generation, but also the new artists of a new generation. And, you know, now you take for granted that this is a place where you have that kind of cultural interaction and where black arts mm -hmm. and black artists voices and perspectives and creations are on view or engaged with both in the black community and in the, you know, the, the north side uh, uh, institutions, uh, which I mean, there were, I never saw a black, a piece of black art in the high museum of art. You know? So, you know, you didn't see that. I mean, and, and, uh, and, you know, when Romar Bearden used to come here at least a couple of times a year, people didn't know who he was. You know, this is the great artist of the time. So, you know, so there's a kind of cosmopolitan nature to this. And, and now you have a, you think about it, uh, Candy, you have a very uh, sophisticated, urbane, uh, black art consumer community here, but you also have, this is a place where black artists live and work and, and are influencing the world. Uh, you know, I, I, since I've left and gone out of this community, uh, you know, I, part of the credentials that I would take to become, and I've been on the board of Studio Museum in Harlem for 40 years, you know, and that went from being a community-based uh, arts institution to now, you know, probably the most influential visual arts institution, one of the most influential visual arts institutions in New York and in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I you, you took those experiences about building arts institutions in community and interacted now with Harlem. And you see that in today, you see Harlem, you know, the Studio Museum in Harlem because it's not of Harlem, but you see this, this, this dialogue between the institution and this community which is changing uh, around it. Uh, we now have a National Museum of African American History and Culture. That was, you know, I was one of the founding directors, but the presiding elder of that was John Lewis. Mm -hmm. And you go back to SNCC and the cultural connection. So I would say that, you know, for th this has been a, a continuous story of social justice, equ equity and equality, creativity, political action, which has driven the, the evolution of the black artistic community in Atlanta. It is different from anywhere else in the world. And, you know, I'm, I was born and reared in Los Angeles, California. I have deep connections in Southern California. I grew up in an area where, you know, there, there was no black art gallery and where the one that emerged, the Brockman Gallery, uh, was one that was, you know, founded by people I knew and is now, that's where Mark Bradford's studio and work is. Uh, even in a big city like Los Angeles, it doesn't have the same feel to it as what we have here. Uh, and the connection between the, the artistic aspirations the, of the black community, the community in which we reside, the political and economic leadership of the community, they come together in ways which I don't see happening elsewhere. And that was 
in some ways, the beginnings of that were in the neighborhood arts center. Wonderful. Yeah, wow. I wish I, wish I could. I wish I could say something comparable uh, about what happened, not just from Nexus. I mean, Nexus was a, a mechanism that sort of took off and found its own uh, way. Um, but I, I, I seem to feel that there's, there's la at least the impression that I have at this point is that we, we've lost some of the magic and the power that we had as a community uh, that uh, was uh, more collaborative in nature. And not just, you know, discipline to, to discipline, but just in the spirit of support of other people. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of groups, but they usually, they usually I mean, there's the, uh, the Atlanta Photography Gallery. I used to be the, the chairman of the board over there, and there was the uh, uh, what do they call the photo forum at the High Museum, and I was the first head of that. Uh, but that just that turned into a fundraising mechanism, which I, I'm no good at, so I was the wrong person for that, and I, I left. Uh, but there was at the time there was a sense of freedom. Uh, emotional, sexual, uh, creative, certainly, uh, that was, uh, you know, running around in, in the 70s. And uh, uh, a lot of work, a lot of photographic work uh, came out of that. Uh, and but what I would see and continue to see uh, on the, uh, in the Black community, the work tended to be focused on uh, Black history uh, and Black icons. Uh, and I didn't run into too many uh, black photographers who were about something. I mean, they, it mattered to them, don't misunderstand me, but I didn't see in the work uh, the same sense of abandon or play uh, or, or freedom because there was a sense of duty uh, and responsibility to, to the community that they were part of. Uh, and I think that that's... Uh, uh, to some extent, although I, as I say, I've backed away from it a lot, but I think to a, to a certain extent, that's still uh, the case. Well, you know, I, I, and I, so I'm getting way out of my league on this, but that won't stop me since I do have a microphone here. Uh, but, but uh, you know, it's really interesting for me because I do think in the beginning, I mean, just think about it. There were, so you're getting this first chance and a lot of the prevailing socioeconomic cultural community, the black community in the early 70s is still related to civil rights. It's still related to gaining rights. It's still related to breaking down the barriers of, of racism. It's, and a lot of the younger people driving the arts work had been involved in SNCC. So, you know, it's gonna be very socially focused and and if you think about what was happening elsewhere in the country, you know, what was going on in Chicago with visual artists, black visual artists in Chicago or with black poetry, it was, it, it, there was a very heavy social element to it, which has always been an element of oppressed people and black people. I, I think it's, you know, I feel like there is an evolution in the black community. And I, you know, I'm so, I'm just taken aback now that, you know, we're now seeing some of the really uh, more edgy black artists of the day, they began, you know, or, you know, or at least highly recognized black artists of today, whether it's, uh, you know, um, our had, you know, they, they went to Morehouse or they went to Spelman or they went to Clark, who, who poor, poor, paints the portrait of the first lady. I mean, she's a, she's a Clark, you know, so, so these, com these, and th this community is now a place and certainly in film and certainly in film of the influence of, of this community on a, on generations of black filmmakers has been great. So, you know, you see that there's been an evolution of, um, uh, of the community to producing some of the most uh, groundbreaking black artists in the, you know, across the disciplines. 
I, I don't understand, and I'm, you know, and I do think there is a racial, different racial and cultural component to this. As, as much as we, we did and have learned to be, an, you know, a civil and integrated community in Atlanta, there is a black community and there's a black arts community. And then there is the other community and whether it's called white or whatever, but it's, there is, I think there is a difference. And I do think they have different, um, they, they, their, their values and their uh, sense of connection are different. And I think, I think that's, a, you know, that's rich and powerful and it is. We've got Meredith here, which means that we're going to have questions. <laughs> we've got questions and answers from uh, from our audience that's been listening, and uh, we've only scratched the surface. Meredith, you weren't supposed to show up so soon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, actually, uh, Dr. Lomax, what you were just talking about um, leads me to this first question, and I think. Um, a lot of it has been addressed already throughout the panel. Um, you know, Chester Old asks about, you know, why Atlanta was so primed for this activity back then with, um, you know, the formation of the Bureau of Cultural Affairs and, you know, um, integration. And, you know, you're talking about uh, SNCC and, and all of that. And, um, and it leads me to, um, kind of a question to the lessons that you may have for people today in this cultural moment, right? Where the, the idea of Atlanta as a black cultural Mecca is being critiqued, you know, and Atlanta is having this incredibly high um, wage gap um, in, in terms of race um, and um, sort of like, what your thoughts are on that and the role of, um, you know, the Atlanta administration, um, you know, the city's administration and how maybe shifts in funding have, have influenced some of that. Um, yeah, I guess just what are some of your lessons um, for artists that are really on the front lines today um, from what you learned um, then when you were working with all these cultural organizers. Yeah. Well, you know, hopefully we, we are learning lessons because you make advances, but you don't solve every problem. You know, uh, I don't do the arts like I used to do. I mean, that was sort of, that was my life. Uh, today I'm uh, involved in education. I've been doing that for the last quarter of a century. Uh, that's how I believe I influence social change through education. But I do think that one of the ironies about Atlanta and is that, and it's also true of other cities which are experiencing extraordinary growth and development and explosions of, you know, all the, the economic uh, stuff is that they are uh, places of extraordinary inequality, which means that, that Atlanta and, and this was something which I observed without being a social scientist or an economist uh, in an earlier time. Atlanta is a city that works for people who have education, credentials, and connections. You know, and so, I mean, when the door is open, you got to have a, you know, you got to get past the bouncer. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you got to know somebody in Atlanta. And, you know, in, in one sense, in, in terms, and certainly in terms of the Black community, this is a city which works very well for well-connected, highly educated Black professionals. Now, I'm going to say that when I came here in 1964, it didn't do that. And when I, I you know, I, I came here in 64, I graduated from Morales in 68, I went off to Columbia University to get a master's degree and I had to leave Columbia because I was about to get drafted and I was going to go into the Vietnam War and I wasn't going to do that. And so I came back to Atlanta to get a job. And I got a job teaching at Morehouse. It gave me an occupational deferment so that I could uh, avoid going to Vietnam or Canada. Those were my choices. Uh, and uh, when the war was over, 
I had, the, I had the, to make a decision. Am I going to stay in Atlanta and get my PhD? Or am I going to go back to Columbia? I could go to Berkeley. I had an offer to go to Dartmouth. And something was happening even, and this was 1971. You know, Black people were beginning to get political power. You were seeing people who graduated from schools in the AU Center maybe not leaving. You were seeing people sort of coming here as a... Uh, and, and and then, I, so I decided to go to Emory. When I finished at Emory in 73, that's the, you know, and, and I spent that summer after I submitted my dissertation working in Maynard Jackson's campaign. When Maynard gets elected, this town just changes completely for black folks. The big sign goes on up and it says, if you are black and professional and you've got talent and ambition, come here. And the and you've had that happening. And what happened in Atlanta over the last 50 years is you've had a, a, this huge in-migration of people who could work in this kind of highly competitive environment. And what has happened to all the poor people, all the people at the bottom? Well, they can't even afford to live. You've just, you know, now that, you know, the urban renewal, their communities are gone. I live in Collier Heights, the old black, mid-century, uh, the black mid-century neighborhood up Hollowell. Let me just tell you, if you're black and you don't own one house here now, you probably not gonna be able to buy one in the next five to 10 years. So you see gentrification happening here. So, you know, I would not say, you know, this is to the point that Chip was making. You know, artists and black people are the pioneers, but once the, once the once the property goes up in value, can't afford to stay here anymore. So I would say that this is really about what have we learned about creating economic opportunity and how, what have we learned about providing people with education that leads to real opportunity, not to dead end jobs. Black people are employed in, in Atlanta, but we have the dead end jobs. We have the jobs that don't go anywhere. And we have that because this is still racism that is keeping Black people out. But also, we haven't really leveraged our political uh, power and our economic power to, to create uh, opportunity and social justice. So I would say that you know, this is the next frontier for this community. So the real question here is, can we be a, an economically vital and growing area and one that where, which is equitable and just and where people have, and where there is great social mobility because right now, Atlanta is one of the least socially mobile places for low income black people. They, 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 if, they were, if they were at the bottom 30 years ago, they're at the bottom today. And how do you, how do you give, how do you create a, uh, that economic mobility? And it requires intentionality and it, and, and it requires new strategies. And I think there's a role for political leadership. I also think there's a powerful role for economic leader, for educational leadership, and a very important role for the, for the Atlanta University Center. You know, I, I just close with this. When you talk about economic opportunity in Atlanta, and you talk about creating, uh, you know, uh, jobs and, and a plan for the future, where do they go when they want academics? But they go to Georgia State, they go to Georgia Tech, and who are the beneficiaries of the plans which are developed? They are white people. You know, there has got to be an intentional uh, engagement of uh, progressive academics in the Atlanta University Center who see part of their role as making a socially just and equitable community to help create policies and practices which will change that uh, so that this is not just a place for the black middle class and for people who come with credentials. It's a place where if you start at the bottom, you don't end up still at the bottom at the end of your life. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to pick up uh, on part of what Michael was saying. Uh, I, when in the 70s, uh, 
hope and possibilities were very much present as the, the very changes that Michael has been talking about, Maynard's uh, administration and, and people like Michael and Shirley and others uh, who worked really hard uh, <clears throat> to kind of unify, get, have a unified notion of what an arts community could look like. I, I think in uh, what I've seen happen in the last 10, 15 years uh, is the, the rush for uh, the quest for success uh, and that the people have set up uh, a pathway, uh, but but it's not necessarily available to people who are very freely working. In other words, they they have to uh, uh, factor in an economic component. And as Michael was saying, you know, in Atlanta, this is a business place, and if you're trying to get your work shown, you either make work for a gallery. Which, which they will tell you is, is uh, marketable or not. Uh, or you rent a, a, a hovel somewhere and uh, you know, share a space with people and find a place to do your work because it's real, it hasn't been, I mean, all of the wonderful uh, spread of cultural awareness that started happening in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, I don't see uh, as much of. There seems to be more of an institutional uh, kind of uh, oversight of where the arts go. And there are certain gallery owners and certain uh, curators, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, when, we, when we came here as kids, I mean, how old was I? Uh, it was a long time ago. I've been here 45 years. And, uh, uh, but we were, we were, to have fun and play and be creative and find new ways to do it and to uh, and to tear down things and build new things and uh, I often wonder about Curtis Patterson, give, uh, you know, and who, who I've always adored not, not only as a, as a person but uh, his work is, uh, is so moving and so beautiful and uh, you know there's a guy that I think is really you know he's world class. Uh, and I've always been inspired by him, but his work was always out there. And uh, I always felt a, a certain sense of, uh, sense of civic pride watching him uh, you know, evolve into a, not only a major uh, sculptor, but as a major black artist. Uh, you know, and, and there are others. I miss John Riddle, bless his heart. He was a wonderful fellow. Uh, and uh, so there were people uh, on both sides of this issue, the, the racial issue, uh, who were supportive in spirit. Uh, and now what I find are uh, certainly in, in the, the new kids on the block, so to speak, they only talk about success, uh, having shows and doing all those kinds of things. And they're afraid to do anything uh, that would threaten their uh, ability to be successful in that context, in that milieu. Uh, which I think is regrettable because we were willing to, I mean, Maurice Clifford, I don't know if you know Maurice, and it's gotten even stranger at this point in life. He's a conspiracy theorist and, and uh, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, he really is. Uh, but uh, when, it, when we had the, the photo gallery on Virginia Avenue, uh, there was an opening, and I can't remember if it was an opening of my pictures or whatever, but Maurice came in to do a uh, 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 a piece where he, he put his hand on the, the, the gallery that was two stories tall and there were poles that supported the, the highest part of the roof. And he decided he was gonna hold on to one of those and walk around it for 24 hours, which he did. Right in the middle of the opening and everything else, you know, and he was, he wouldn't talk to you. He just got inside of this. Now, I don't know if things like that are still going on, but we allowed, uh, we allowed him the freedom to do that. So, okay, you know, you won't be in our way and, and do your thing. So uh, there was a spirit of play and experimentation. And now I find, at least in the people that I encounter, it's, it's rigidified to the point where they want to know, how do, what do I have to do to get a master's degree? How do I, how do I get my first show? Uh, how can I make my first sale? And all this kind of stuff. And you're talking about people that are I don't know, 22 years old, 23 years old, and haven't really experienced a lot, uh, and yet they think they're ready. 
And it's just what I've learned at the age of 75, is that it, or as Miles Davis once said, sometimes it takes a long time to learn what you sound like. You know? And uh, that's, that's where I find myself, for example. I mean, I've made more discoveries in the last 10 years about who I am and what I've done. And I've done a lot of stuff. I mean, behind me, there are thousands of sheets of paper. Uh, many of them are, uh, aren't worth looking at, actually, in retrospect, you know, but I was young and, and, and I was willing to take chances. And uh, so it, it pains me greatly that I feel less of a, a cohesion uh, in the arts community, in part, certainly on my side of the street, because people are trying to become successes, even if they haven't really earned it. You know, I'd just like to share what I've seen from Atlanta, you know, as a researcher that, um, of course, Maynard and the 1% for the arts was, you know, was, you know, phenomenal and has, you know, we, we could certainly do more of that. Um, the, these two centers as, you know, a, a founding place for the arts was great. What we haven't done economically is, again, like what you hear from both of these gentlemen, is help the individual artist or the art gallery and create the economics of buying and becoming better art patrons you know, in the city. So that's kind of where I kind of situate where we have not done as, as good a job. Michael, you're on mute if you were about to say, if you're gonna add something. Well, uh, you know, Michael, you're- I, I hit something and I lost my screen. You know, I just, the. I, this is so. This is so interesting. You know, I really think about. I mean, uh, there's a Julie Muratu. Is that how you pronounce her show opening up at the uh, at the High Museum? Uh, a black female artist, and and her work was championed by Thelma Golden at the Studio Museum, and you know she's big, big deal now. Um, you know, I I hear you, Chip, on the. The um, this sort of gallerist uh, academic pro approach that you get to being you know a successful artist. Uh, you know what I've seen in my lifetime uh, is um, artist shows in the basement of Trevor Arnett, where you know an artist would get a great artist would be paid five hundred dollars for a work. And uh, today, a black artist, um, and great for AU because now they have an extraordinarily rich and deep uh, collection. To uh, a time when today, in you know, the people who have been in the studio museum studio program are people like you know Kahendi Wiley and. You know, Mark Bradford and uh, just this extraordinary list of black artists who are now uh, whose work and and point of view and aesthetic is, you know, shaping the art world. Uh, so I think that, you know, the we we perhaps have lost in some way a sense of a smaller community in the black community, but we've become part of a larger and more cosmopolitan community, which is, um, you know, all over the place. You know, when I, I went to see Soul of a Nation and I saw that, I saw it in all places, you know, I saw it in uh, Arkansas at the uh, Crystal Bridges. And here is all of this artwork by artists that you knew in the 60s, black artists, you know, bad bodacious black artists telling it like it is in bold colors and afro cobrick and all that stuff P artists from chicago artists from los angeles artists uh artists from atlanta who were in that show and it's taken a half century and th and that show came to crystal bridges from the tate i think in london you know and um Black art is now, uh, you know, it is now global. Okay, uh, so we have lost a little bit of that sense of a, a little community. 
in the Peter James Bryant School that became the Neighborhood Art Center. We've lost a little of that community that was the Center for Black Art on Gordon Street, where, by the way, Skunder Bogassian, a great Ethiopian artist, work was, where Marion Brown, a great jazz artist, came from France to be in residence there. Uh, you know, where, um, you know, just our voices, our perspective, our sense of what the duty of the artist is, the way the artist tells his, his her story, the impact that they are to have, you know, is now uh, not viewed as marginal, it's at the center. And so I'm prepared to trade marginality for being at the center. What I do think, if we really reconnect to the roots of the Neighborhood Art Center, it will be that there is a really powerful purpose that artists can help us see in our own lives to build community, uh, to build opportunity for others, to allow others to have uh, full and rich lives. You know, I did a lot of politics for a long time and I, I did some things when I was an elected official, which I now regret, I built a jail. You know, I, mean, I built the Fulton County Jail. I thought, you know, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I didn't tear down the juvenile justice, the juvenile detention facility, but I also built libraries. And I also, but we also built art centers. And I always thought that the most important work I ever did as an elected official was supporting education and the arts, because those are things that, those are things that help bring out the humanity in us and connect us to the humanity and others. I just think that Atlanta is a city which probably is too focused on commercial success, as Chip has said. Money drives everything in Atlanta today. I think it's time for some, you know, for, for some, for, for artists to, to stand up and speak, you know, and to, to fight. I do think we had some courageous artists back in the day but maybe, you know, that's because we were, you know, I don't know. But we could use some more. We could use some more. And I think this is not a time for comfort. This is a time for discomfort. And I think it's a time for action. And, and I want to hear the voices of artists challenging us to be better than we are and to ensure that uh, this is a, you know, a better community. If you think about who our icons have been, our icons have been Dr. King, they've been, you know, John, who always talked about the beloved community. We're not a beloved community. We're a getting and spending community. Let's be a little bit more focused on beloved and let's get some artists to help us find our way back to our, our souls and our spirit. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Yeah, I, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. oh, I just love that because that came up in the last conversation too. Alice Loveless said, um, Oh, I knew Alice. Of the Neighborhood Art Center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she was talking about, um, you know, focusing on what we do as artists and, you know, arts administrators when, you know, we have to take on the role of owning a space or whatever is it's being of service to the community instead of being a star or whatever. And so I was just interested in what came up earlier in the conversation about these sort of two ethics that were talked about of like ethic, the ethics, the ethic, work ethic of um, art for community versus art as a self-conscious practice for perhaps only artists or something like this um, and for a certain kind of patrons. And um, just learning so much from listening to this, this early history. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, at that time, it seemed like those things might've been closer together or something like this. And then today we have this like social practice kind of work too. Um, and I think one of the main things that have come up in these conversations is the role of community. Um, in arts organizations and how that sort of shifts around. 
um, through time. And so I'm wondering if, um, you know, we're coming to the close here, if you two have any just, you know, final things that you want to leave us um, with or pose questions about, you know, going into the future with, with these histories um, and, you know, how important it is for us to reconsider these histories, right, and, and what we do. Well, I'm so glad that Art Papers is doing this because this shouldn't be done by the Atlanta History Center. You know, I mean, I, you know, at Art at the Atlanta History Center oftentimes is the cyclorama. So, you know, I mean, I'm just, I just don't think that's the, the I, that's a cheap shot. But, you know, I mean, I, I, I think this is about living, breathing artists who have a, I, I don't see, and I'm not an artist, but I don't see the difference between commitment to craft. And I mean, I, I think I, I, all artists, I've, great artists have a commitment to craft, but they also, you know, I think part of what we do see is an aesthetic which says there's a social content, there's a social purpose, there's an, there is an impact that is not just, you know, color and form. Um, and, uh, and I think that's such an exciting thing. You know, as I said, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm very active on the board at Studio Museum in Harlem. And this is sort of my last couple of years there because we're building a, a new building. And that's when that's done, I'm done. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that there's a big question about, and we're asking ourselves in a moment of pandemic, how do we engage this community that we are in and of? And how do we, you know, bring the, the values and the perspective of the artists to this time of trauma. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's a question we should be asking artists. And I think that as we think about the solves for Atlanta, uh, this can't just be the economic impact of the arts. It's got to be the spiritual impact of the arts. It's got to be about the community impact of the arts. I think everything has become valued on the basis of material. And, you know, uh, and so that means that we're gonna have to break away. I have a painting behind me, which is a, uh, is I bought at the estate sale of, uh, of uh, Richard Long. And oh. some of you knew Richard, you know, he was a, an art collector. And this one, did, I, the Swan Gallery didn't take it and put it up for sale with his collection of Romeo Bridens and others. I don't know, I don't know who painted it, but it had pride of place in Richard's home. It was always in his dining room. And it's a painting which I think was painted in the 1930s of a black, you know, of a, of a lynching. This is a victim of a lynching. It, it, you know, it's kind of a Pieta kind of thing, you know, holding you know, the lynching victim, a kind of Christ-like figure, and there are Klu Klan's people in the background. I think this is such a powerful painting. I mean, it's, you know, it's probably 70 or maybe 80 years old. It's, it was, it's so dirty around the bottom that if there's a signature, I can't see it, so I got to get it cleaned carefully. But whoever the artist was, was connected to the world in which she, he lived, and was using the art you know, this is up to, this was that artist's reaction to a gruesome, terrible environment in which black people live. And, 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 but it was also a piece of art which was designed to change that behavior. And, you know, artists have played such powerful roles in society and community. And I have, a, I just sometimes sense about Atlanta is that to, to Chip's point, people are so focused on their careers that they're maybe not as focused on the purpose and the meaning and the impulse. And I think in the seventies, you know, some wonderful artists and they were one, I mean, you know, Tony K. Bambara, excuse me, great literary artist. Uh, Curtis Patterson was hanging out down there at, uh, at the Neighborhood Art Center, John Riddle, you know, but they were, they did see a sense of purpose in their work that was beyond their careers and the impact that they could have. And I think being that that's certainly something that we could reflect on. And I hope that uh, we will learn more about the past and, 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 you know, 
pick at it and find the things that you know are uh, can help us have a better today and a and certainly a better future. And I want to thank you for letting me be a part of this today. Thank you. Uh, I would like I would like to conclude by saying that uh, I had a very privileged education at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, I never expected it. I didn't really know what the school was like. I was told I needed to go there, so I ended up there. Uh, but what I learned that has stuck with me most is that I'm a part of a, a family of artists that goes back at least six centuries. And, uh, and I build it around the, uh, the discipline of drawing. Uh, photography, when it was first created, was referred to as the pencil of nature, and people didn't believe that it was accurate. They would hold a picture of a building in front of the building and count the bricks in the building and then count the bricks in the picture to see if they matched, right? Uh, so there's always been uh, a drive for a kind of uh, evolution and clarity of vision uh, that comes along with, that goes along with time and experience. And uh, I've, I'm at a point now where I look for uh, comf comfort, comfort and, and companionship in older people uh, uh, because they're, they're more aware of what their intention and their function is. And uh, uh, they're willing to uh, do what it, what it requires and to make sacrifices where it's necessary. Uh, and people like John Riddle, was always available to me, or, or you know, or Joe Jennings, the the horn player, uh, who I've known for many many years, and a number of the uh, musicians uh, from that part of the city, because uh, uh, I'm a jazz uh, a jazz aficionado as well. I, I find this a very close uh, uh, relationship between expressive jazz music and expressive photography. You know, it's spontaneous. It's it comes out somehow you're not exactly sure uh but i've always seen a, a corollary there but nonetheless uh what i what i would like to encourage people to do uh is to continue to have dialogue to continue to go out of their way to meet other people uh you know the nexus party used to be a great way to integrate the neighborhood and uh be good food and loud music and uh and people would just go around and look at everybody's work and it was available to everybody. Uh, now, if I'm mistaken uh, that there is no such uh, energy uh, uh, in the city, then, I, uh, then I'm, I'm okay with that. I'd love to know more about it. But I, I find uh, increasingly the people are, are sort of going off on, in little uh, packets and trying to uh, uh, find their own way and they keep bumping into walls. I think that's it for me. Uh, but I, but I want to tell you, it's a real treat to, to have Michael here. Like I said, I've known him since the seventies. Uh, hope your family's doing well, Michael. Hope the kids are great. And, uh, but it was really uh, exciting to watch him work and to watch him work within the political system and Shirley as well. And, uh, you know, taking advantage of uh, the, the power, getting close to power. I mean, I, I, I came to Atlanta shortly after the Shag Cates gang abandoned the city uh, and said to the black community, you want it, you can have it. And they just sort of left. Uh, so there was a, it was a, uh, a wild west town for a while in a political sense. So I think uh, Michael has come out pretty well, uh, a little less hairy, but he's still got that beard. He was ahead of his time. Uh, but anyway, I, th I thank you all for this opportunity. I, I, I was uh, very well informed by it and I appreciate the fact that you've organized such a thing and uh, I'd like to go back now and watch the recordings of the rest of the uh, speakers. So thank you. Well, thank you both. Um, I've, I've appeared here at the end to, uh, to primarily, I, I think, and, and maybe not surprisingly, but, but to primarily thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael and Chip and Candy. Uh, 
this final panel has been monumental. Um, I feel edified and energized. I, you know, it's been a really significant ending to, you know, what have all been really interesting and insightful panels. But I, I'm, I'm really happy that we chose to go back in time um, because I feel like we've arrived uh, at such a, a wealth of perspective in, in ending here. Um, and we also arrived at uh, our own beginnings, um, uh, our sort of destination of our own birth as Art Papers is also a child of the 70s, um, founded in 1977. So we're, we're sort of um, uh, on this panel in spirit. And uh, so if you'll indulge me, since I've been watching all of these panels, I, I want to offer just a few closing thoughts um, in response to sort of the, the holistic conversation that's been happening. First, um, I want to acknowledge that this series has only been a selection of the many grassroots artist-run and DIY spaces that have um, you know, existed and enriched Atlanta's arts community over the years necessarily for the sake of you know, making this, um, you know, bite sizes, um, we knew that it would, it would be a sampling. And, uh, and also, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, being a bit limited by our own time here with an audience, but also the time of others. Um, you know, it's, it's been two, mm, a year and a half in the making, but then derailed a bit, you know, by uh, 2020. So, um, you know, we're, we're very, um, grateful for those of you that all decided to brave a Zoom symposium, both uh, on the panels and in the audience. Um, I wanted to highlight a few ideas that emerged uh, across the five conversations and, and in the hopes of maybe kind of synthesizing a few things. Um, one phrase that, that caught my ear early on was beautiful chaos which is something that Rachel Palmberg first uh, spoke about in terms of eye drums early, early times. And uh, that was also um, sort of echoed by Jeff Mather speaking about the Mattress Factory group. And, um, and I think that that really uh, encapsulates how it can feel for a small group of people to take on a project that is either you know, in initially a bit bigger than themselves, a bit unwieldy, or that becomes so. Um, the ex expectations of others coming in and, you know, the, the pressures of sustainability. Um, beautiful chaos seems to really capture the spirit of many of these projects. Um, another thing that came up is risk. Um, the risk that, uh, that folks took to start something new, um, to put themselves out there in that way to the community, but also, um, and, and maybe even more crucially, creating opportunities for others to take risk and how that has been central to um, how meaningful many of these spaces and projects have been to the community over the years um, and how valuable. Another thing that came up a lot was space. Um, space as an opportunity, as a prompt, as an instigation, but um, maybe most so as a crucial resource and a fraught resource, um, a resource that is you know, wrapped up in real estate, economics, the city planning and development, you know, the, the difficulty that artists feel in taking opportunities for space when they know that what they do in that space can be mobilized towards gentrification, towards displacement, um, and yet having few opportunities outside of those times and places to, uh, to occupy and use space. Um, and so, you know, those questions of, of um, space as a resource that can lead to a kind of complicity that feels complicated after the fact um, recurred and I think are very um, salient for our moment. Another question that came up a lot was sustainability. How do we make these spaces able to continue, able to grow? Um, why can't we keep them all the time? <laughs> you know, why, why don't we have them all still here with us? And, you know, and those, uh, those questions had a lot of different answers, but another thing that emerged is that sometimes things run their course. Um, sometimes institutionality or becoming, you know, a formal institution would mean losing something that is central and at the core of what these spaces embody. Um, and, you know, and that leads to another theme of independence that came up. 
um, you know, the independence to uh, be unafraid to taste, take those risks, uh, to not be beholden to a funder or to a, um, you know, to a, a structure. And, um, and as Meredith brought up, um, Alice Lovelace's really wonderful observation that we do these things in service, um, that it's an act of service to the community. And, um, and community being really centrally a, a part of something that people observed as being uniquely Atlanta. Uh, the Atlanta community has its own set of particularities that are unique. Um, many spaces addressed community um, out of a desire to create a place where um, they could break down the either racially or economically segregated nature of the larger institutional spaces, wanting to bring people together across racial divides, but also across disciplinary divides and um, you know, try to undo those spaces of separation that they would see in the larger space of Atlanta. And many did so really successfully. Um, and to pick up on something that came up towards the end, collaboration, um, especially across spaces that are maybe more siloed in today's um, communities, spaces of music, writing, uh, performance, visual art in a sort of object making sense and visual art in a more sort of community engaged educational sense. You know, there is a, a sense that these things have become more fractured um, and that they, they occupy their own enclosed spaces. But I will uh, put forward the observation that in each panel, even the 20 teens, uh, collaboration across disciplines was really central to at least one and usually more than one of the spaces. You know, going uh, to Arts Exchange, Cafe Bezozo, and Little Beirut um, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, iDrum um, was a, in, inherently interdisciplinary. Apache Cafe in the 2000s is a, a wonderful example of a holistic space of poetry, writing, visual art, music, um, and the bakery in the 20 teens is I think a really good um, case study in interdisciplinary DIY spaces. So, so these things do exist and I think that the, the thread was connected through all of them to, uh, today and yesterday. And so after kind of offering some sum up uh, I just want to thank again our panelists on this panel um, and on all of those that went before, to our moderators who are incredibly engaged and um, really did a wonderful job, and to Meredith Cooley who really uh, kicked this entire uh, series off through her own um, explorations of people's most beloved DIY and grassroots spaces and for really shepherding this through. Um, so thank you to Meredith. Can I give a little shout out to Willow? Yeah, shout out to Willow. <laughs> yeah, and to Willow Goldstein too uh, of the bakery who was on the 2010s panel, um, who um, you know was really instrumental to the beginning of this conversation also. And, uh, and I have to close by saying that the videos, transcripts, expanded biographies of the panelists and moderators, and uh, a wealth of images beyond just those that were featured in the little um, sort of intro slideshows are going to be made available on artpapers.org. So if you only caught a bit of this and want to get the whole picture, or if you want to return to it and revisit some of the wisdom that's been imparted by all of these wonderful people, um, you'll be able to do that on artpapers.org. So thank you to everyone who's gone on this journey with us. Mm -hmm. And if nobody has anything else to say, we can say farewell to farewell. founding stories. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. I, uh, I appreciate being asked. Great to see you, Chip. Thank you, Mike. Tell Kathy I said howdy. We'll catch she's, up uh, one of these. She's, uh, she's now uh, 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 development director of the ACLU of Georgia. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? OK. Yeah, can tell everybody I said no. And, and I, when, when we all can come out of uh, seclusion, I'll look forward to seeing you on the streets of Atlanta. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And great to be with you. Thank great you. to meet everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.